So um, uh, the three panelists are Steve Gray. I don't need to introduce Steve, I don't think anymore, except to say that um, over the last couple of weeks, it's been hard to fully wrap our minds around all of the sort of going forth stuff as we've been managing all the logistics of this amazing event. So um, I want to give him a lot of credit for juggling many balls all together. He's quite a guy to work with. Um, so no more I need to say about Steve. You can say whatever else you want to say. Um, and then, well, let's just do one at a time. So Steve, you want to start, please? Sure. And I've told them all that I'm going to start nudging after their 15 minutes. Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, once again, we're on the uh, remembering that one of the songs we used in this Carmack territory from that movie. Uh, there was a lot of wisdom in the room yesterday, and it seems to me a lot of clarity about about uh, what happened in the U.S. Ken reviewed uh, some of the history of the resistance against the Site C Dam. Um, and I guess for me, I, I want to start my remarks when we think back about uh, the big hope of the provincial election. Uh, we worked hard to have the parties harden their positions on Site C, and we worked hard to make Site C an election issue, and I think we succeeded at that. There's a strong group in Vancouver called Fight C that was leafleting and lobbying and getting cards out and petitions signed. There are folks in Kelowna who are organizing, the Sunshine Coast Gang, the Alliance for Democracy, the Rolling Justice Bus here in Victoria, people up and down the island in central and northern BC. So many people around the province, and you guys are a big part of all of that. Meeting, writing letters, writing op-eds, lobbying, talking to people. We heard uh, and got the voices of experts and good journalists. We had um, many of us worked hard to get good candidates elected. Uh, Bob Federley is here. Bob, you want to put up your hand? He ran on, uh, in the um, Peace River North. In, the, in his fight against Site C, and we uh, we may I'm not sure uh, we may have an elected MLA here today in the crowd. After the election, of course, the BCUC process unfolded and a tremendous amount of energy went into that and we participated in that in good faith. So yesterday we heard a number of people on the panelists but also from the, from the floor a number of theories of why we got the wrong decision. One of the things mentioned was the, the, um, the unions. Another thing that came up was the corporate world, the, the, money, uh, the money to be made on the project, I suppose. The, I don't know if we talked about it yesterday, but I wonder, um, if there wasn't a problem with the NDP getting into power with a complete lack of preparation to govern. Sorry, can you hear me now? So I'm just saying that it seemed to me that um, uh, we heard a number of theories yesterday about why we got the wrong decision. And so one group mentioned were the unions, another group mentioned were the corporate world, the money to be made on the project and all of that. And the nervousness that I think we're all aware of of the NDP being called the party of no, um, and they're worried about being accepted. Um, something else though was uh, that I wonder about is the um, complete lack of preparation to govern. You remember uh, they got into power, uh, they, that there was a whole process about how long it took them to actually take, to, to be named the government and, the, and getting together the Green Party and sorting that all out. It's a lot of effort and they're only in there by the slimmest of, of margins. Uh, maybe we could put up the first uh, the slide that I had there if it's, it's not there. So one thing I want to mention is that in all that fight that was going on and all the work that had been done before the election was called, um, the NDP adopted something called the um, Power BC. You may have seen it on the internet, you may have seen it during the election. That platform is essentially the platform that people in this room hold. Um, the issues around not flooding the First Nations, encroaching on the land there, not flooding the ecosystems, retaining the farmland. It's laid out in this Power BC plan. I think we actually succeeded in making that, um, uh, having the NDP make that their platform. But when they got into power then, in that nervousness that they had, they hardly replaced anybody in the bureaucracy. Uh, they, did, they made virtually no changes. Um, so I wonder, they didn't expect to govern very long. Um, they were worried about, again, being the party of no, if they, if they began uh, wholesale firings of the, of the upper level in the civil service. Pretty difficult in the face of the mainstream media and public opinion, the severance costs and all of that. 
there were a few changes at BC Hydro. Um, the board was left largely intact, the management left largely intact. Um, people uh, were brought up who were part of the whole Site C decision, maybe given a little bit more power within BC Hydro. Um, I suppose they were trying to be responsible, but maybe part of this was a lack of courage to, to go where they needed to go. At any rate, uh, we, we ended up with the BCUC process, and um, I would say in the BCUC process, we also succeeded. So we succeeded getting the platform, we, I mean, big collective, then we succeeded in front of the BC Utilities Commission. I think that was to the surprise of the, uh, the people um, uh, in the bureaucracy and the BC Hydro. And then things carried on from there, and of course the, the decision later was that uh, um, the project would not proceed. But, but bef after the BC um, Utilities Commission event, uh, a number of attended the um, NDP convention and talked to different ministers and I talked to specifically spoke to Adrian Dixon he explained to me that well look we can't be meeting with you guys anymore and, and getting your input and all of that it's kind of like a municipal council once you uh, have the public hearings then you're meant to step back and we step back and we don't uh, we don't want to talk to anybody I thought oh that sounds reasonable enough except wait a minute you're still meeting with the proponents so they continued to meet with the proponents while they froze us out and so they didn't actually do what they thought they were doing. And I thought, who gave them that advice? Um, so to some degree, again, there's a lack of experience here. They did, the, the, the politicians didn't really understand what they were doing, in my view. Um, however, we kept pushing. And eventually, we got um, some experts in the cabinet. And we heard from one of them yesterday, Rob McCullough. And, and others attended the cabinet meeting and, and had a discussion. We succeeded there again. So we had an op another opportunity, got in front of them. I think all of that is, was pretty positive. But in the end, what we heard yesterday, and I think it may well be true, is that there was a capture of the, um, of the politicians by the bureaucracy and perhaps some of the corporate world. Um, when we saw the announcement yesterday, we watched it and we saw Horgan there. Um, we could see that, uh, well, he said it was a bad project, just too late. So I don't know if we actually lost the basic understanding. I think he still understands this is a crappy project, and there we succeeded. Uh, the problem is that this, uh, Seth laid it out yesterday, this question of fear. Um, so we lost to a made-up storyline. And who were the people who made up the storyline? The longtime advocates of the project, the planners, the, the people in, the hyd in BC Hydro, the bureaucracy. They had union support, of course, in the corporate sector. Remember the words, we're no longer activists, now we have to be good administrators. That was kind of funny. They turned on their values, their values I guess they thought were too risky. So now we face these hurdles. Public opinion is, is really difficult to turn that around, but I think we heard yesterday about the train wreck coming and maybe that gives us our big opportunity. We have a hurdle of face saving. I think the opportunity there is new information or new circumstances which are sure to come with the train wreck. And then finally, the increasing commitments and costs will may, may cause some big problems. In my view, the fight back involves, on firstly, a demand that they take responsibility for the decision they made in terms of their values. Uh, number one on my list would be that they drop the slap suit against the, the um, uh, Peace Valley defenders who held the Rocky Mountain Fort. It's a strategic lawsuit against public participation. They, may, they then need to bring in anti-slap suit legislation. A peaceful protest must be protected in a democracy. Then I think they must pick up the demand that was being made repeatedly on the Liberal government, which was that we need to take care for the social dislocation, the damage that will be caused by a mega project, in particular, the um, uh, addressing the questions behind murdered and missing Indigenous women and children. They need to watch out for trafficking, human trafficking in the work camp. And uh, any notion of that stuff coming, they need to launch something now if they're going to stick with their values. Next thing I'd be concerned about is corruption. There's billions of dollars at, at stake here, and we need to keep the uh, um, watching carefully. And any hint of corruption needs to be dealt with with the uh, full strength of the law. Then we heard yesterday about the government of China um, and the state-owned enterprise taking over ICON and the trade agreements. That kind of stuff is also an, an area where I think we could be leaning on, on the NDP in terms of where their positions might be. Uh, at every turn, I believe we need to amplify the wrong decision was made here. We heard yesterday some very clear stuff and we'll put on the web later today uh, some documents laying out exactly what we heard yesterday in sort of easy to understand terms we hope. There's a problem I think with energy level uh, possibly for all of us. Um, 
but we need to keep moving forward in my view. I think there is a chance that uh, termination will come. It's difficult to see it right now, but we have things that are coming up where, to, where we can uh, amplify our message about this being a wrong decision. We'll have a communique out of the summit. We've got the injunction application coming, the Kelowna by-election, Hydro Financial Review, the Auditor General's Review, the ALR Review, the Throne Speech, the Budget. We've got two book tours coming up. We talked about those books yesterday. We've got the release of political donations coming up. We've got the spring legislative, legislative session and a demand for a climate action plan. The flooding is about, I think it's seven years away. Um, and then in terms of new information, there'll be the geotechnical problems, the tension cracks in the slides. Tension cracks in the slides are likely to continue. We need to be ready. Um, and I think some discussion with people who worked on the kiosk, uh, opposing the kiosk um, um, hydroelectric project and the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project and hear what they did, study their train wreck a little bit and see if there's some lessons there for us. And then we've got this problem of the mismanagement at BC Hydro. Again, the Premier talked about it yesterday and then he did nothing about it. Um, very strange. The BCUC and the Deloitte report both raised questions about it and through the good work of the PVLA we are having the releases being put out now and I think this needs to continue about the, the kiwatt bids being much double the, what the um, uh, Hydro expected them to be in terms of the, the first projects there and then the contract going to Flatiron who's previously failed in their ability to complete a contract with BC Hydro. So the mismanagement appears to be continuing and we can focus on that. Then we've got the court cases coming up with the Blueberry court case in March. Um, we've got the West Moberly and Prophet River injunction application which we can support and we need to demand that work be soft, that we respect the courts, that no contracts be issued um, and I'd like to see the release of risk management numbers from the government and I think the really um, perfect stance and appropriate thing that we're doing, we're saying we are treaty people, we need to honour the treaties and stand back from this. The um, other thing to mention, um, Chief Bob Chamberlain mentioned yesterday, these, these court cases are expensive deals and so there does need to be significant fundraising done um, at the moment. Uh, we're fundraising here on the side for the Yellow Stakes campaign for Nunwadi a Stewardship Society to support the court case of the West Mobility First Nations and Prophet River. So we have a job to do, right? Um, Finally, I guess I'd touch on the, the, the accountability issue and, and we'll hear more. I think uh, Kai is going to talk about this, but it seems to me that's the pointed end of the stick that we need to, that ne now needs to be um, uh, demonstrated. And from my point of view, that's probably recall. And, and um, do we recall one or two members who can start that in November? Um, and that's kind of the idea of where, how do we actually get accountability from elected people? It seems the only thing that maybe really matters is re-election. Um, I commend to you, you can look it up on the website, Indivisible, it's some stuff that's come out of some Democratic congressmen workers that talk about the kind of uh, picking up the Tea Party tactics, turning up all the time, the tactics of the Tea Party, not the views of the Tea Party. Turning up all the time, always being there and raising the issues. Um, the, the danger we have, of course, is if, we, if you push too hard in the incompetence of the NDP government, then we may end up back with the Liberals, which would be an unfortunate turn of events from my perspective. So we it's sort of going at uh, one at a time, recall and replace perhaps is a, is a way to go. And we need to build courage and principles within the new, new Democratic Party. Perhaps that's where I'll end. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, he was feeling pressure from me. I'm sorry, Steve. Um, and there was a lot there. So, yes, is it possible? It's, um, rather than doing that, I can prepare something which um, lays out what I've done and then the few things I didn't say. Sure, we can put it up on the web on Monday. Okay. I, why stop now? <laughs> right. um, so um, I, I just, for those of you who do follow the agenda on the website, I, I forgot to mention and I apologize that um, Chief Bob Chamberlain, who was going to be on this panel, has graciously accepted um, instead moving into the accountability and democracy uh, working group.
um, so that we can, so uh, he will not be speaking now, but he will be in that workshop and ha will have lots to say about accountability as it relates to First Nations. Thank you, Bob. Um, so the next person on the panel is Kai Nagata um, from the Dogwood Initiative. Kai is the communications director for Dogwood. And for those of you who may not know Dogwood, it has a long and deep reputation um, for uh, undertaking um, projects which really focus on uh, increasing the power of ordinary people by on the ground organizing and by using the levers of power that will strengthen our ability as ordinary people to um, affect the decisions that are made by government. And they take those projects seriously. And in particular, um, we wanted to have Kai because some people just have a strategic kind of way of thinking. And we thought that Kai might have some very interesting things to say about political parties and what we could be doing, which might stimulate especially the accountability and democracy, but the other working groups later. So with no further ado, Kai, you're on. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, if you don't want to give them a, a heads up, you could cut the live feed now, but... Uh, um, so I'm from East Van, uh, and my MLA is uh, Shane Simpson. He's been there since I was a teenager, and all he's ever wanted was to be in cabinet. And so after 13 years, he got his wish, he was sworn in, and he sat down with our local Dogwood team in East Vancouver, and he said without prompting, we're going to kill Site C. And we thought, great, because there's a lot of other stuff on our plate right now, uh, so it's really good to know that's taken care of. And indeed, you know, our flagship campaign for the last 10 years has been about stopping the expansion of oil tanker traffic on the BC coast, and at the same time, we were facing some really disturbing signals on the Kinder Morgan project. There's an old... Uh, an old saying that if you chase two rabbits, you catch none. And so last fall, as we started to realize that the Site C discussion was going off the rails inside Cabinet, we were also dealing with uh, the BC government going to court against the Squamish nation to defend Kinder Morgan and handing out permits by the dozens for construction. And so we chose to focus on the Kinder Morgan fight, and now here we are. So I want to talk about two things this morning. Revenge. This is, this is a church, folks. I didn't realize it was that kind of a church, but it sounds like people are down for some smiting. Um, so revenge and transformation. And these things are not mutually exclusive, but I think it's going to be up to the folks in this room over the next few months and years to decide how much energy to put into each category. And so there's sort of three pathways to seek revenge and to bring about transformation. And Steve has already alluded to a couple of them. And so I just wanted to go through in chronological order and offer a little bit of an analysis, an outsider's view, if you will, of the opportunities coming up. So the, the first opportunity is coming up next month. And if you really wanted to send a signal, actually the people who could do this are, well, they were in the room last night. You've got three green MLAs who have to vote on a budget in February. And you could make the case to those MLAs that on a number of issues, that are near and dear to their hearts, this new government is proving to be quite a disappointment. And if those MLAs voted against the budget, the government would fall. There are consequences to consider in bringing down the government, like who comes next. And the reality is that if either the NDP or the BC Liberals were to win the subsequent election, they'd probably keep building the Site C Dam. And so that's something to consider. But you have another opportunity to bring down the government 
later this year, starting in November. And so that's what Steve mentioned, which is recall. And we are the only province in Canada that has this kind of legislation. And recall comes from the Wild West. It was when the governors in the Western states became so corrupt that the only way to remove them was through direct democracy, through a popular petition. And so we do have a process in BC where any registered voter in a riding can bring a petition for recall against their MLA. And if you collect 40% signatures from 40% of the folks in that riding, you can force a by-election. And if you did that in one or two ridings in BC, you would flip the balance of power and you could force another election or you could hold by-elections and get MLAs in who held a different position on the project. So that becomes an option 18 months after an election. So that gives you until November. Also a gamble. Not only could the petition fail, but you could also find yourself with unintended consequences, again, as a result of bringing down the government. But sometimes the sweet taste of revenge is worth pushing thoughts of those consequences a little further into the future. There's one other mechanism that's available that could stop the project and inflict serious political damage to the, new, the, the governing New Democrats, and that's an initiative petition. And so this is housed under the same legislation as recall. It's another direct democracy mechanism. And basically, you could write a bill that would put a stop to this project, and you could take it out to the people of BC to gather support. And if you got signatures from 10% of the voters, in every riding across the province. You could force that bill into the legislature, and with the backing of half a million people or more, the NDP MLAs who neglected to speak up about the dam in December might be compelled to switch their position and vote in favor of a bill like that. It's, again, a huge undertaking. And it's something that we have talked about in the context of oil tanker projects. It is something that is challenging when you are facing an uphill battle on public opinion. But what you really need is 10% of people who are really passionate about the issue. You don't need a majority. You need a passionate minority. And you might argue that Site C is one of those issues that inspires a passionate 10% across the province. So that's another option. And that could completely change the, the balance of power and the public conversation around this, this project. Let's turn then to talk a little bit about transformation. And again, these are not mutually exclusive. But your first option is to transform the party that made this decision. How many, how many folks in here are currently members of the BC NDP? And how many folks have in the last few months lost their membership cards or torn them up or slid them into the fireplace? Oh, interesting. So we're applauding. Unfortunately, this strategy would require signing up again. Party members determine the candidates that are running an election and they determine the platform through the, through the um, convention process. And so on a slightly longer time frame, you can imagine how committed, organized groups of, dare I say, Tea Party-like insurgents within riding associations in BC could advance candidates who are not beholden to the party whip, who know their own mind and are accountable to their own constituents. And you could bring forward resolutions that would turn into party platform points down the line, in this case, fall 2019, when the NDP holds its next convention. So you could transform the New Democrats. You could also transform the system that we operate within to elect our MLAs. And I know there's a number of people in this room that are working on proportional representation. So it's not a coincidence to me that the same lobbyists who defended this 1950s nostalgia project because it was good for workers are the same people who are now vehemently opposed to changing the voting system. We're talking about 
old power versus something new. And the people who have the most to gain from the system as it is currently constructed, regardless of their political stripes, are fighting hard against electoral reform because they realize it puts at risk everything they have built. And you could argue that a proportional voting system, because it eliminates strategic voting, would open up space for MLAs in the legislature who express views a little bit more like what you might have heard from Adam Olson or Sonia Furstenau, who are less beholden to the party whip. And in this case, you would have three parties that are in favor of fracking, Site C, and business as usual, and you would have one party that isn't, which would present a clear choice for folks who then could vote for what they wanted instead of voting against what they don't want. So that is another option, and it feels like maybe a little bit of a, a detour if you're closely focused on one issue, but you could take the momentum from the Site C fight and channel it into totally shuffling the deck on the electoral reform file. So that's another option. And I guess the third and most difficult and long-term option is to transform the culture. Because John Horgan, it's unfortunate to say, had a lot of political cover in December to go up there and move this project forward because the majority of British Columbians, as it turned out, thought that was the right move. And even a healthy plurality within his own party still believe that that was the right move. And so how do you change public opinion? How do you change people's understanding of this project? And I, I think that's where I want to leave off because Emma Gilchrist has probably done as much as any individual person in BC to help change the popular understanding of this project. But I think Horgan gave us a clue as to the arguments that he found most persuasive by making it a pocketbook issue, by using the sunk costs fallacy, by talking about it in terms of loss aversion. And so understanding the psychology of the people who support the, the dam and then figuring out ways to undo that and reverse that position, I think is a, a longer term challenge, but it would solve a lot of other problems at the same time. So I'm gonna hand it over to Emma to talk a little bit more, hopefully about the public's understanding of this project and how to reach people at scale with facts when it's easier sometimes to retreat into dogma and fear. So thanks very much. I'm gonna hand it over to Emma. Lovely and fair. Thanks so much, Kai. That was great. Um, so uh, we're gonna move to um, Emma now, and uh, just I'm gonna say a couple of sentences just very quickly before I introduce you, which is think back on what happened after the NDP government made the decision and try to think of one mainstream media report that you read that actually critiqued the NDP rationale for its decision. That did any work on trying to figure out, well, is this true what they're saying about the bonds? Is this true what they're saying about amortization? Is this true about all of the stuff that we went over yesterday? I can't think of one mainstream media, um, you know, mainstream, like major uh, writer or commentator that did. But who did? Were people like Emma and others. Um, you, you heard Nick, uh, Andrew Nikoforic yesterday. Emma Gilchrist is the uh, editor-in-chief of Desmog Canada. And um, the first time I found the Desmog page, which was actually only a couple years ago now, I think, year and a half, I went, wow, this is great. And I, I, I get the feed, so I know what's on. And Emma and Sarah Cox and many other writers are, uh, are constantly going at the issue of Site C and other issues that, of course, we really care about in relation to the environment. Uh, on a daily basis, so it's a real pleasure to have you here, Emma, and you're gonna have a few minutes to add to this. Thank you. Thank you. So, do I have slides? I saw them appear momentarily. I do maybe have slides. There we go. So, first of all, I'm so impressive to see so many people here 
thanks for coming out. It never ceases to amaze me how many armchair experts there are on the site CDM in BC. And we see this on our, in our comment section on our website all the time and it warms our heart. So I'm just curious actually, just by a show of hands, how many of you subscribe to the TIE or DSMOT Canada? <laughs> Amazing, pretty much everybody. How many subscribe to both? Almost everybody. You know, it's something for everyone to aspire to. <laughs> um, so this is one of my favorite quotes about journalism. It's, it's pretty searing. You'd almost think I maybe wrote it myself, but I didn't. Um, so some newspapers dig. Some newspapers are a constant embarrassment to the powerful. Some manage to be entertaining, provocative, and fair at the same time. There are a few such newspapers in Canada. So, this was actually written by a Senate committee on mass media in 1970. That was nearly 50 years ago now, if you do the math on that. Um, and since then, things have gotten a lot worse. So Canada has one of the most monopolized media landscapes in the world. Since 2008, we've lost more than 10,000 media jobs. And there are now four PR people for every journalist in our country. Yeah, <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> Those are the official stats. Um, so how has that played out on Site C? That has obviously had a fundamental impact on the way that the conversation around the Site C dam has played out. First of all, it has meant a real lack of coverage, especially in the early days. So when we first started investigating Site C about four years ago, only four in 10 British Columbians had even heard of Site C. I think it's kind of important to reflect upon that because although I know you didn't get the outcome you're looking for with the NDP decision, the fact that Site C ended up being this much of a political hot potato says quite a lot compared to where this issue was a few years ago when barely anybody had even heard of the thing. So it's come a long way. But the other way that the downfall of traditional media has really impacted the debate over Site C, I think is actually more important than just the lack of coverage. It's the quality of that coverage. Um, and this is largely because there are so few beat reporters left. So a beat reporter is someone who, you know, just works the environment beat or the science beat or the business beat or whatever. I honestly have a really hard time thinking of a single environment beat reporter left in BC who doesn't work for DSMOG Canada <laughs> or the TAI. Um, so I wrote a full piece about how the media failed British Columbians on Site C after the NDP decision, but here are just a few examples. Um, for instance, the Vancouver Sun reported for years repeatedly that the joint review panel had approved the Site C dam. Um, myself and my colleagues, Carol Linnett, who's here, and Sarah Cox, who is here, and Ben Parfit, who I think might be here too, and Judith Avoy, you know, we had a team of basically four or five beat reporters working Site C for four years, thanks to the support of many of the people in this room. So that really makes a, you know, a really huge difference. So we had actually read the joint review panel report, and we knew that it actually didn't approve the Site C dam, and we knew it had some really interesting things to say about alternatives, we knew it sounded quite a lot like the authors of that report weren't super impressed with the project, actually. <laughs> so we had a hunch that it might be worth reaching out to Harry Swain to see what he had to say about it. Um, there were, you know, I think even more fundamental um, kind of lack of understanding in the traditional media. Um, after the NDP decision, the Globe and Mail and the Vancouver Sun both referred to the First Nations court cases like dragging out the process on Site C, dragging their heels. Um, which just represents a total misunderstanding of the fact that not a single entity in Canada has yet to rule on whether there's a treaty violation of this project. And from reading the traditional media, you would think that, you know, these First Nations are just being pesky and dragging their heels on this thing, which is obviously deeply offensive. Um, so enter the independent media. Uh, this is where, you know, people like us, the Tai, the Georgia Strait come into the picture. Harry Swain once called us the canary in the coal mine, and I'm gonna stick with that. <laughs> um, so 
really, you know, having all of these beat reporters on this issue has allowed us to provide a drumbeat of coverage. Uh, I, I actually counted, um, and we wrote over 60 stories on the Sight See Dam in the last year. Um, big. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So big stories like, I do have slides about this, but I think maybe they're not. Oh, I'm able to click. Where's the clicker? <laughs> I was like, I'll roll without it. Oh, okay, go, go forward a few. I've kind of rolled through all of this. Um, okay, the next one. This one, here we go, drum beat coverage, guys. So this is a story by Sarah Cox um, from 18 months ago. And she was the first one to report that, what do you know, Site C was behind schedule and over budget. And for this story, we were awarded with a press release from BC Hydro saying it was wrong. <laughs> so there is a, quite a bit of schadenfreude going on when the uh, BCUC report came out and essentially said everything we ever reported was right. Um, next slide. So being focused on the speed has also allowed us to do a tremendous amount of investigative work, which is something that you pretty much don't see in the traditional media anymore, if you think about it. There's very little investigative work going on. Um, so yeah, after the NDP decision, you know, we actually were like, what about that financial rationale that the NDP is making? Is it right? And uh, Sarah went out and she found out that that actually didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, we did the first interviews with Harry Swain, with Mark Ellison, with David Vardy, from, you know, who was involved with the Muskrat Falls Project. And all of those were picked up by the Globe and Mail, the CBC, and others. Uh, next slide. But I think the most impactful work that we were able to do, and this really speaks to like reaching the masses, our, a lot of these articles, they're really important and they influence the larger debate and they influence traditional media, but there's only so many people like interested in going down the rabbit hole on Site C and like 10% of you are in this room. <laughs> so, um, you know, what we've really worked to do too is to, to kind of popular, popularize the issue of Site C and make it approachable to people. Um, this video, one-on-one -on -one with Harry Swain, was shared 50,000 times, uh, viewed over 1.6 million times. I did some math and about one in three adults in British Columbia has watched that video. So, um, you know, things like that. We were, thanks to reader donations, we were able to commission independent polling on the Sightsee Dam. We were able to send the awesome photographer Garth Lenz up to capture unprecedented photos of the valley and the construction. Um, so, on the next slide. You know, some people wonder what good all of this does, but the reach of independent media is farther than you might think. There's this kind of new phrase in the media world called trickle up journalism. And in, you know, the way things are going with traditional media not having the resources, a lot of specialist outlets like ourselves are doing that work and it's actually influencing the reporting by larger news outlets like the New York Times. Um, so we spent weeks on the phone with this reporter um, and he ended up linking back to our reporting uh, five, five times from his story. So to wrap up, because that was supposed to only take five minutes. <laughs> um, next slide, please. The old media is not coming back. Um, who knows, you know, there's rapid evolution of what the media landscape is going to look like, but it's not going to look like what it looked like 10 years ago. So we need to stop even hoping for that to come around again. I think uh, to a certain extent we need to stop, you know, wringing our hands about, ooh, the traditional media or the mainstream media. Also, let's stop calling it the mainstream media because just because we operate online does not make us alternative media. It's 2018, we run a website. Over 100,000 people read it every month. We're pretty mainstream. Um, this kind of civic function journalism is essential to democracy. Uh, the model for it isn't really proven in Canada yet. We're trying to prove a reader-funded model can work in Canada. And I think moving forward to both keep up the pressure on Site C and to ensure, you know, uh, these kinds of uh, fundamental, you know, 
acts against the public interest don't happen again, we need to make sure that we have a strong watchdog media in Canada and we need to get behind that. Thank you. Uh, so I just a asked Emma, thank you so much. Um, what, what do you want us to call you? I said, is it watchdog media? And she said, or independent media. So we might as well start getting our terms. <laughs>